Good morning, church. Great to see you today. I'm thankful for this opportunity to fill in for Pastor Jeremy. It's a good time to get away after vacation Bible school, right? It's a busy week, and uh, pray for him as he's away. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 24, so if you wouldn't mind turning there, Matthew chapter 24. If you don't know who I am, uh, around here I'm known as Stephanie Secura's husband or Allison's dad. I'm proud of both of those titles. Summers can be very busy for most of us, for a lot of us, but it's also a good time to uh, catch our breath. Uh, so while you're enjoying the summer, remember our groups. We have one I just heard that's leaving this morning to Utah, Alabama, and our young people that will be heading to camp. We had a great group at camp at Fort Bluff last week of Ray County students, and many came to Christ. So summers can be busy, but also refreshing. And I pray, as I prayed the last few days, that you'll be spiritually refreshed today. Thank you for your faithfulness to be here in God's house. Michael read from Hebrews about as we see the day approaching, the day of the Lord, we ought to gather more and more. So thank you for being here today with God's people. Uh, this is a place that faithfully offers hope through the message of Jesus Christ every Sunday. Everybody needs Jesus. Listening to Eric Metaxas on Breakpoint a couple years ago, he was quoting from the Translational Psychiatry uh, Journal. And he presented these stats, and I was kind of amazed at these stats. More than 36% of teen girls in America are depressed or anxious. Teen boys, it's slightly less alarming, just slightly 13.6%. 40 million Americans today, this morning, are anxious and really unhappy in life. It wasn't always this bad writing in the National Review online. Mona Sharon reports that the rates for depression and anxiety and unhappiness were much lower in the Great Depression, World War II, and the turbulent 1970s. There's a lot of factors. Sometimes you need to see a doctor. Sometimes there's breakdowns in the home. There's a lot of factors that attribute to this, but somewhere deep inside, Unhappy people know that they were meant for something more. They were meant for something more. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. It's actually not about mere happiness, is it? C.S. Lewis, I know a lot of you read C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote a lot of great things, and this is what he said, quote, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. And yet Lewis claimed that there was something beyond mere happiness, and he said it was joy. And the Lord uses that to draw us to himself. He went on to say, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition. When infinite joy is offered us, we are far too easily pleased. And so this morning, Jesus offers himself as the answer for us. He simply says, come to me. If you come to me, he says, you'll find rest. You'll find that peace that you're looking for. You'll find that joy that's missing in your life. So pray for our youth this summer as they head off to Utah, Alabama, as they head off to camps. And pray for precious people here today in this first service this Sunday morning that need answers that only Jesus can give. It's a challenge sometimes. There's a lot of distractions out there, um, a lot of voices. We're bombarded with messages from our culture constantly. Those of us who lived through the 1970s, uh, the stats are that we were exposed to about 500 messages a day. In 2019, that number according to the digital marketing experts, is between 4,000 and 10,000 every day. We're bombarded with these messages. There's commercial ads, print ads, brand labels, Facebook ads, Google ads, phone ads. And there's a message from the scriptures that we're going to look into today that will refocus us and hopefully encourage us. I want to begin by relaying a story from one of my favorite people on the planet I listened to his story on Focus on the Family. I got to meet Ernie Johnson Jr. at the Final Four. And uh, he loves Jesus Christ with all of his heart. And he was a special guest. He's on TNT. And he shared that day about a story from his dad that at his dad's funeral, Ernie shared this back in 2011. 
His dad, as you know, was the voice of the Atlanta Braves for 30 years. His dad played for the Milwaukee Braves and the Atlanta Braves. Ernie Johnson Jr., if you're watching a Major League Baseball game and he's the commentator, he has his dad's baseball card right there. They were really close. And so his dad was getting up in years and they wanted to write a book on Ernie Johnson Sr., so they asked Sr., what's the most memorable baseball moment you had? And they assumed it would be something from the Milwaukee Braves or maybe when the Braves went to Japan or maybe the 1995 World Series, but instead he said, it was when my son, Ernie Johnson Jr., was eight years old playing Little League. He said, that's my favorite moment that I'll never forget. And he said they were playing a game, and the opposite team hit a baseball, and it bounced over the right field fence. It was a ground rule double. And all of you Little League coaches out there know that you only issue three baseballs in Little League, so you've got to find that ball. So the right fielder and the center fielder, they jumped over the fence and went into the thicket looking for the baseball. And the baseball coach and the team waited. And they waited. And these guys didn't come back. So the coach and Ernie, who played in the infield, they went and jumped over the fence. And they found these two boys in the thicket. Their gloves were on the ground. The ball was at their feet. And both hands were filled with blackberries. <laughs> and they were just enjoying the goodness of God. And stepped away from the game. Church, I love you. And this morning, I just ask that you just drop your wall. Just step away from the game. Whatever's overwhelming you, whatever's troubling you, whatever you're battling, and taste and see that the Lord is good. Let the Word encourage you today. One of the most studied chapters in the Bible is Matthew chapter 24. Bible scholars have been studying this chapter for centuries. It's interesting. I want us to look briefly at this chapter, then I want to focus our attention at the end in chapter 25 with how we are to live in 2019 in relation to the truths that Jesus gives us in chapter 24. So let's begin in chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to, the, to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? This statement that Jesus made here about the temple was a shocker for the disciples. He says, I'm telling you, this temple, this beautiful, all these buildings you're showing me, there's coming a day, there won't be one stone upon another. It's going to be different. It's going to be different. And so he goes on to say, it triggered these questions. They, they, when will these things be, Jesus? And then the second question, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The larger context of these questions really started back in Matthew 16, verse 21. It says there, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Jesus was setting the stage for what the disciples thought was going to be a showdown with the religious leaders in Jerusalem. He said, that's where I'm heading. This is what's going to happen. In chapter 17, if you turn back a few pages and look up at the screen, this is what happens next in the story. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Can you imagine? That had to be awesome. He was transfigured. These Old Testament men show up. This must have further led them to believe that he was going to establish his kingdom. Jesus is awesome. In chapter 19, Jesus said that the disciples would sit on thrones judging Israel. In chapter 21 of Matthew, he rides into the city on a donkey. It was, it was glorious. Then he overturns the tables of the money changers. He's showing his authority now. 
He goes on to further establish his authority in chapter 21, verse 43, saying, Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, the religious leaders, and given to a people producing its fruits. So the disciples are feeling confident now. All these things are stacking up. In chapters 22 and 23, he takes on the tough questions by the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders to the point where they stopped asking him questions. They were so frustrated with him. The the disciples, obviously thinking that Jesus was about to set up his kingdom, were in shock when he says what he says about the temple and Jerusalem in chapter 24. I imagine they were, how does that fit with you being the Messiah, Jesus? Jesus. We're here to take over, right? So they pressed him with these questions. They associated his coming with the end of the world. They were not able to separate his first coming from his second coming. So through verse 34 of chapter 24, Jesus spoke to them about the temple and about the city being destroyed. He answered the first part of their question. And as you know from history, Titus and the Roman army came and laid the city waste between A.D. 66 and 70. It was a devastating time for the Jews. Verse 15, Jesus said, Daniel's prophecy is going to be fulfilled. I'm coming to fulfill it. Josephus, a historian, recorded over one million Jews slaughtered, and many more taking slave. Persecution and death were not on the minds of the disciples at this time when Jesus was teaching this. But this was coming soon. And Jesus said through verse 34, when you see these signs that he outlined, he said, flee the city, go into the mountains because devastation is coming. And the key verse in this passage, look at verse 34. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. But then Jesus addresses the second half of their question. They said, What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? This is what we all want to know. This is what they wanted to know. Every generation since Jesus' day. Jesus, when are you coming back? Are there signs? How will we know? And how are we to live? In verse 36 of this chapter, look there. He begins with the word but. It's a connector word. The subject matter is changing now. He says, but concerning that day... An hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. He uses that day, singular. Earlier in verses 4 through 34, he used days, plural, speaking about the tribulation to come. That day is a phrase used in the Bible to identify the final day of history. The Old Testament, even into the New Testament, it's called the day of the Lord. In verses 42 through 44, Jesus said that that day will come like a thief in the night. Look at verse 42 through 44. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour You do not expect. Now it's biblical to say that nobody knows when Jesus is coming back. Don't look for signs, Jesus says. Look for me. Look for the Savior. So we are to watch. And then Jesus expands this thought by telling stories, right? He was the greatest storyteller ever. He gives all this theology, what's going to happen when Titus comes, and then they want to know, when are you coming back? And he gives theology, and he tells them how to wait and to watch. And he tells stories, parables. In his parable of the faithful servant, in verses 45 through 51, Jesus was teaching his disciples to avoid worldly sin. He said, don't be engaged continually in sin, because verse 50, it says, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And in an hour when he does not know. Hey, we can make application right here, church, right? If you came in those doors today living in sin, struggling in sin, we don't have to leave that way. We're only one prayer away from being totally right with God. We can leave here. You and I can leave here right with God. 
And we can be purified. Remember what John wrote in 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Jesus is coming back. We don't know what that's going to be like, but in light of the fact that he's coming again, we're going to purify ourselves as Jesus is pure. It means that much. The next parable is in chapter 25, the next story. And he talks about the ten virgins. Look at chapter 25, verses 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. And then down in verse number 13, he concludes by saying, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Again, he's teaching, be alert, watch. Five were ready, five were not ready. He says, be ready, because Jesus is coming like the bridegroom at any moment. But the parable we want to finish with this morning and focus our time is teaching us something more. We are to be alert. We are to watch, but we are to be active, church. There's something that we need to do. While we are watching for Jesus, we need to be ready for when he appears. While we're being actively watching, we need to be actively at work, doing something. Be active this summer. Don't take the summer off. Be active this fall. Be active for the rest of your life because nobody knows the day or the hour. We have this time to be active and to be faithful. And we are stewards of our lives. We are stewards of our opportunities. One day you and I will be evaluated based on our stewardship. This moment, this vapor, this mist of life that we have, one day Jesus will evaluate that and reward us accordingly. So we are stewards of our time. We are stewards of opportunities. Having a mission gives you a purpose Tim Brady, who's from Asheville, spoke at our camp last summer, and he made this statement in passing. He says, if you're not dead, you're not done. I've never forgotten that. doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. If you're not dead, you're not done. We're still looking for Jesus to come. I became a believer at age 16. I was the first saved in my family. My dad was Russian Orthodox, but basically an atheist. He was only Russian Orthodox because his family came from the Ukraine. And I was the first one saved in my family. And I began to witness to my grandfather, who was a Roman Catholic Italian from Italy, migrated over here. And we would sit on his back porch and he would smoke his pipe and we would listen to pirate baseball games together. And I would witness, I would tell him about Jesus. And after he would have enough, he'd pull that pipe out and he said, David, I'm a good man. I take care of you grandkids. I take care of our neighbors. I'll take my chances. Let's talk about something else. And he'd stick that pipe back in there. And then as he was 89 years old, he started to crack a little bit. And I remember sitting on the porch, and this has been years of witnessing to my grandfather and being intimidated by him and frustrated. And he finally said, I've often wondered why God put me here. And I wanted to say, but I was too embarrassed or intimidated. I said, Grandpa, you're 89. You don't know why you're here. It's kind of late. At my grandmother's funeral later that year, he sat on the front row. I presented the gospel, and my grandfather came to know Jesus. Virginio DeSantis came to know Jesus that day. And for the last three years of his life, we were brothers. Why are you here? We have a stewardship. We, we have a moment in time. Have you answered that question? What, what gets you up in the morning? What are you living for? Why are you here? It's easy to float through life and school, on the job. You can be so distracted by stuff that we really, you and I can miss out on what really matters in life. You must know why you were here. Jesus said he's coming back. You remember in John 14, he says, I'm going away. I'm preparing a place for you and I will come again. And everything in the Bible that pointed to Jesus coming the first time it came to pass, and we can have confidence without a doubt that everything talking about a second coming will come to pass. Jesus is coming back. And we encourage ourselves, and we gather together more knowing that that day is coming. He's coming again. And if you're watching for Jesus, how are you living for Jesus? Because how you live matters. 
Because God made you, you have value. If you are his, you have a platform. You were created uniquely. Some of you will recognize this next slide. It's an electric football set. Some of you guys. When I was a little boy, that was my God. I had an electric football set. It was the most important thing. We were very poor, and this was the greatest possession I had. I had 24 football teams, NFL football teams, and I set up their schedules. I kept all their records. Jack Snow from the L.A. Rams ran back more touchdown returns than anybody in my league. I had Super Bowls every year. The Steelers always won my Super Bowl because I'm from Pittsburgh, and that's probably why. I had Pro Bowls with the best players from the AFC and the NFC. If you could have seen me as a little boy, you could have seen my bent in life, how God created me, because for the last 29 years, I've been organizing national tournaments. And here in Ray County, we bring these teams in. And some of these guys have gone on to the NBA and to the WNBA and to the NFL and Major League Baseball. And it's just simply my platform to share Jesus Christ with athletes. It's my bent in life. It's how I was built. My disc assessment personality is precisionist. I just love the details. Let me ask you two questions. What is it that you do well? You're a teacher. You're in construction. What is it that you do well and what is it that you enjoy doing? With those two questions in mind, listen to this next parable. Look down in chapter 25, verse 14. Another story. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Now we associate talent with skill in our day, right? In the Bible days, it has to do with money. A talent was the largest unit of currency in the Greek economic world. And so this is what it's about. He gives these guys this money. He gives them a talent. One talent was 10,000 denarii. What does that mean? One denarius was a daily wage. We know that because of another story that Jesus told. It was about a farmer who was trying to get people to work with him for the day. He says, if you come work in my fields, I'll give you a denarius at the end of the day. So if you took that daily wage, a denarius, and multiplied it by 10,000, that's the value of a talent. So just for fun, in our day, let's be real conservative and say the average income in the state of Tennessee is $30,000. If you work 260 days, you would earn $115 a day. You take $115 in our day, multiply it by 10,000, it's 1,150,000. If you work for 40 years making 30 grand, that's 1,200,000. I think the point is that God has gifted us with great value. He didn't give us $5 skills, $10 opportunities. He has invested in us greatly. Our bent in life, our natural abilities. It's our platform that we can use for him. He's also careful about it. He said there, each according to his ability. No one has your talents. Nobody has your opportunities. Nobody else does. And it's up to you to develop it, to be a good steward. This is not your spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives you at conversion. This is your bet in life. This is who you are, what you're made of. So these guys have opportunities. Let's see how we can apply it like they did. Look at verse 16. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he that had the two talents made two talents more. These two guys went to work. The Bible says they went and traded. In our vernacular, they studied the market. They bought stocks low and sold high. They watched the business channel. I mean, they, they studied the market. They were investing with money that didn't belong to them. It belonged to their master. And they did this knowing that they could fail, but they weren't afraid to fail. They were going for it. They risked it all. Both guys doubled their investments. They were busy while the master was away. So what did the master say when he returned? Well, we get a glimpse into history here. Let's look down to verse number 20. He commended them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. 
His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He commended him, didn't he? He did a good job. We're given a glimpse into the future with these verses. I told my Sunday school class a couple Sundays ago about when I was with SCORE International and I had to raise support to go to Costa Rica. And so I had stepped away from the camp and I was raising support and just trying to raise money any way I could. And I went to Georgia. My sister-in-law's father-in-law has a landscaping business and he was always excited when I came because he always saved the hard jobs for me. And I was a younger guy than he was. And so I would work for him and we'd work and sweat all day. And at the end of the day, I enjoyed going back to Mr. Thomas's house. He would leave me in the kitchen and he would go back wherever he saved his money and kept his money. And he'd come back out with a $100 bill. And he gave it to me and I proudly stuck that in my pocket. And that was $100 more getting me closer to going to Costa Rica. At the end of the spring, when I was getting ready to leave for Costa Rica to the mission field, he put me in his car and he was going to drive me back to my vehicle. And he got real quiet and he was going to say something to me. And, and he said, David, you have done a great job. If you're ever back through Suwannee, Georgia, I'd love to use you again. And as I got into my car, another man looking at my body of work and praising me meant something to me. Can you imagine standing before Jesus and he evaluates your stewardship and he praises you for it? What about the second guy? The first guy, he had five, now he has ten. That's impressive. The second guy had two. He only has four. What did the Lord say to him? Look down at verse 23. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He said the exact same thing, didn't he? He said the exact same thing. What does that mean to you and me? It means that your fruit may be different than Pastor Jeremy or Billy Graham or whoever, but the praise is exactly the same. It doesn't matter if, you have, if you're a ten-talent person or a one-talent person. If you're faithful, the praise is exactly the same. So maybe you're sitting here today and you say, Honestly, Dave, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know what I'm good at. I don't, maybe you're a young person. You don't know what you do well. This is my encouragement to you. I would encourage you to get involved in everything at this church. Bug our pastors about things to do because as you get involved in the church, in the local church, you will discover your spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gave you. You will also discover that, hey, I'm good at organizing. I'm, I'm good at props. I'm, I'm good at social media. I'm, I'm good at all these different things that will rise to the surface. You'll realize what you're good at, what you enjoy doing, and that will be your platform to tell people about Jesus. That's your platform. Mr. David Edwards picked me up on a school bus to drive me to church when I was a kid. He was faithful to visit me every Saturday. He brought me gum, came to visit me every Saturday and picked me up every Sunday. When there was two feet of snow in western Pennsylvania, he came and got me in his car. And he couldn't read or write. But he was a truck driver. And he could drive a bus. And he was faithful to pick me up. The last time I preached in my home church, he had just had a stroke and they wheeled him in the back and he was still faithfully showing up and impacting young people for Jesus. As we are watching for Jesus, we have to be active for Jesus. Whatever you're doing and doing well, that's your talent, that's your opportunity. Uh, Joey mentioned and, and Michael prayed this morning for our group going to Alabama. They're actually going to Utah, Alabama. John Zeller, this next slide. This is John. He's the executive director of SCORE International. Our group is going with SCORE International. John Zeller's a neat guy. He uh, spoke for us at the camp just a couple weeks ago. He has cancer. He uh, has been battling for quite a while, and the doctors said, you have 24 months. And so he was talking to the athletes at our camp, and he told us when the doctor said that, he says, how many months has that been? It's been five months. He says, I'm down to like 19 months now. But John Zeller's a neat guy. He was the activities pastor at Idlewild Baptist Church in Tampa, 
Tony Dungy and his family he goes to this church. It's a great church. Activities pastor is just getting better and better. And God called him to score international. He would go to score and have to raise full support. He would leave a great income and a great future and raise full support. But he loves athletics. He's one of the chaplains for the Yankees. He's here with Andy Pettit. He's told us about how he has loved on Alex Rodriguez and given him notes laced with the gospel. Now he has a ministry with Judge and Stanton and Sabathia and the Yankees and the, and the Yankees in Tampa on, on the minor league team. Sports is his platform. What is yours? What is it that you do well and enjoy doing? Karen used her ability as a nurse at our camp last week. What a platform that is. What is your platform? You have a platform and it's powerful. How about that third guy in this parable? Did the master notice him? The first guy, five talents, he's got ten. The second guy, two, he's got four. The third guy was given one. Did the Lord notice him? Look at verse 18. It says here, but he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Skip down to verse 24. He also had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. His words, did they pop out to you? He said, I was afraid. I was afraid. I remember hearing Charles Stanley, he was asked, what's the most discouraging thing about being a pastor? He says, it's the congregation, the people in the congregation who know to do right, but they're afraid to do it. They're afraid to surrender. They're afraid to give their life to the Lord. He said, I didn't do anything with your talent. I didn't, I didn't risk. I, I, I just hid it because I was afraid I would lose it. And so here it is. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be fully surrendered, don't you? I remember that moment, the first time I totally surrendered. I was age 19, and God had been working on my heart to call me into the ministry, and I was I was so intimidated by that that I would have to stand before people like you and that I would fail and I would not be able to do what God is trying to tell me to do. And I was afraid and I was selling Bibles door to door to make my way through college and I'm in Georgia and my best friend's girlfriend that night in front of our house was hit by a car and, and she was killed instantly. And I remember being on the street with her as the ambulance was coming and I could hear the sirens and it was, the pavement was hot and Karen was there and she was with God. And all I could picture was what must that be like? She's in the presence of God. And Karen was a godly girl. And I went back into my room later that night. And for the first time, really, I got on my knees and I had a glimpse of eternity. And I said, God, whatever it means, I give you all of myself. All of myself. And I went back to college and changed my major to Bible and started preparing for the ministry. And we have to do that daily. Paul says, I die daily. But there's that moment when you fully surrender and, and you're not afraid anymore to put your life into God's hand. He owns us anyway. But this guy didn't do that. You know, if you only live for yourself, you can only live for one person. If you live for God and use your spiritual gifts and talents for God, the potential is seven billion. And it doesn't matter if you have ten talents or one talent. What matters is that you invest your life and your opportunities in the kingdom because we're all stewards of what God has given to us. And we steward what doesn't belong to us. Even our lives are purchased by the blood of Jesus. But we steward. This next guy, you might recognize him. Does anybody recognize him? Michelangelo. Michelangelo. At age 21, he was already doing mature sculpting. By age 30, he had already given us the Pieta and the David, still masterpieces to this day. So Pope Julius II came to him and asked him to sculpt a papal tomb. And he was pretty fired up about that. I'm sure that was in his wheelhouse. That's what he does best, was sculpt. 
Then the Pope came back and changed his mind. He says, ah, there's this uh, small chapel at the Vatican. I'd like for you to paint maybe four biblical scenes with maybe 12 characters from the Bible. Well, four years later, he had painted over 400 characters from the Bible and 12 biblical scenes, many on his back on a scaffolding. When he got done, he told his friends he felt as old as Jeremiah. He, he suffered a lot physically. But he used his talents, his opportunities, his abilities for God. And that was 1512. That's been 507 years ago. Wow. Somebody asked him while they were having tours of the Sistine Chapel and they were looking at this masterpiece and he was in there and somebody said, why did you pay so much attention to the corners? I can see detail there, but I can't make it out. Why did you do that when, when nobody can really see what that is? And his answer was classic. He said, God will. And so he will. You may be popular and well-known in Ray County and everybody knows your name. You may be sitting here today and hardly anybody knows your name, but God sees you. And God knows that you're in that prayer closet faithfully praying. God knows that you're sowing seed. God sees you, and that's what matters. Because one day we will stand before him and give an account. So take whatever it is that you do well. If you don't know, see our pastor, see me. We'll talk and pray about it. You have unique abilities and opportunities that we don't have. You will impact Ray County as you are alertly watching for Jesus and actively serving him. And now is the time. Take the next step this morning. If you haven't, I encourage you to surrender to the Lord. And enjoy the blessings of that. And be faithful in your stewardship. One day we'll see the Savior and we'll hear these words of evaluation and affirmation. You need hope today? I'm so thankful that I can tell you as a preacher of the gospel that Jesus just simply says, come to me. He says, if you come to me, uh, you'll find rest. You'll, you'll find the answers that you're looking for. Come to me. You know, there's another parable we won't read because of time in chapter 25, but it's about the sheep and the goats. And it's interesting because to the sheep, Jesus said, you have fed me. And given me drink and, and took me in and clothed me and cared for me when I was sick. And you visited me when I was in prison. You did all these things for me. And the sheep said, when did we, when did we do that for you? I don't, remember, I don't recall. And Jesus said, when you did these to the least of these, my brethren, it's like you did it for me. The goats didn't care. But Jesus said, when you have served the body of Christ, when you've served others this way, it's like you've done that for me. One thing I love about our church, and there are things that go on behind the scenes a lot of us don't know about. People that are being fed, people that are being taken care of. When somebody passes away, there are people in this congregation that are loving, that are taking care of us. That's what it looks like to occupy till I come. That's what it looks like to get involved as we wait for Jesus to return. Be involved in that. Students hurt. Get involved in their lives. Sometimes it's messy. But John said, if you don't love the brothers who you can see, how can you tell me you love Jesus who you haven't seen yet? So some takeaways as we close this morning. Number one, live like you won't be surprised when Jesus returns. It'll be a normal day. The Bible says people will be getting married. Uh, people will be eating and drinking and working. But watch and wait and live holy, knowing that Jesus is coming. Number two, care for your stewardship. You are a steward of what doesn't belong to you. God has invested in you lavishly. He's given you opportunities and time and talents and use it for the cause of Christ. Whatever you do well and enjoy doing, that's your platform, whatever that is. Number three, be faithful, even if his return is delayed. Be faithful. I was in Food City and was talking to a man and he said, you guys keep talking about Jesus coming. It's, you've been talking about that for centuries. He hasn't come yet. And I said, he's only coming back once. And so you got to be ready. Be faithful. If it's, it could be today. 
It could be 20 years. It could be 200 years. It doesn't matter. We live every day as if Jesus is coming. And if you're not dead, you're not done. Number four, improve your master's assets. The two guys that went and traded improved on what didn't belong to them. It wasn't their money. They were improving their master's assets. And their joy came from simply serving him. And number five, watch as so transformed by the gospel that you unselfishly serve other people. And as you do, as if you're serving Jesus himself. Be ready. If you're not saved this morning, Pastor Joey and I will be up front. We'll be happy to talk to you or somebody will take a Bible into another room and show you how you can know Jesus as your Savior. If you're discouraged this morning or anxious, find a mature believer on your row or see us. And Jesus says, just come to me. I'll give you the rest and joy that you need. And as a believer, be watching. He will come when we least expect him to come. So don't live for yourself. Be a faithful steward. God is watching. He will bless you and reward you as you live that way because he loves us that way. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this instruction in the Bible about the fact and the promise and the hope that you're coming again. And it will happen. We don't know when, but it will happen. And thank you for these stories that you told that illustrated how we are to live. So I pray today for somebody that's here that's not saved. Lord, may they just come to you. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Right there in their pew, they can come forward. I pray for anybody that's living in sin, that's convicted by the Holy Spirit now, just to leave that at your altar, at your feet this morning, and leave here right with you. And may we all be encouraged to use our abilities and opportunities that you have given to us for you to build your kingdom. And I pray that you bless in this time of invitation to meet our needs. We pray this.